Uh, this is the College of Becoming Black Students. And you are entitled to show how complex you are. Two very important rules. The first is one fool at a time, everybody else keeps quiet. <laughs> and that's usually the rule with a microphone. Uh, the second is that we do not insult anybody. Oh. Their <laughs> ideas are fair game, but not their mamas or their persons. Okay. Uh, hey, how's everyone doing today? Uh, we're all okay. Okay. Right. Uh, hi, I'm Emil Cambria. I'll be presenting today talking about my film festival, the Chicago International Social Change Film Festival. So I had a chance to read up on your organization and really um, just amazed at some of the great topics, some of the great speakers, and I, you know, wonder why I didn't get a chance to be here today. So thank you for your time, and I just want to tell you a little bit about our festival. Always the device. Um, just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm a professor at North Park University, and I share in the thought that The Wealth of Nations um, is uh, one of the most influential um, books of all time. I teach microeconomics, I teach in the MBA program, I spend time at J.P. Morgan Chase, investment banking, spend some time in politics, spend some time in community service organizations, and I do a, a couple other things on the side as well. I also run the 21st Century Youth Project, we, where, we, where we teach middle and high school students to create mobile applications. So the whole idea is that we have smartphones, technology is a big part of everything we do, part of this presentation, part of film, part of every capacity. So how do we make sure that these students learn this stuff? How do we make sure these students get involved in being able to affect the change in their communities, but also being able to be sustainable and do a lot of different things that are pretty amazing. Now. So we worked with about seven different school districts when we first started, and now we'll be working in six different cities in the fall. So we've been more than thrilled with some of the success that we've had. We won an Edison Award as the most innovative educational program in America. But one thing that I always saw from this process is I wanted to highlight all the students that were learning these amazing things. You know, we had students that didn't know anything about computer programming. They didn't know what an application really meant, that they can actually create it themselves. So we actually empowered them by being able to teach them how do you make an app, how do you make something cool, how do you make something fun, something interesting, that hopefully that your school can download, that your friends can download, and being able to see what kind of creative thoughts and processes go from that. So from that process of working with you know, these kids and being able to see some of the great things they've been able to do, I thought, you know, I want to film these students. I want to be able to showcase these students and some of the great accomplishments that they've had. And from that, you know, I started to say, well, where am I going to show these films? Uh, I'm a filmmaker. I have one project that's currently on HBO. And I thought to myself, all right, where am I going to show these films? Where am I going to highlight the change that's taking place in the communities? Where, you know, the average household income in the particular communities that some of our schools are is 18,000. See that 6% of the students actually graduate from college. So seeing that and seeing exactly what are the opportunities, I wanted to be able to highlight that. And so I said to myself, there weren't too many forms to showcase these kind of students, so I'm just going to make it myself. And that's kind of how this came about. So I worked with another guy by the name of Todd Belcour, who was an attorney at the Sergeant Shriver Center for Poverty Law. And we've been able to just go from something that was just small to something that is much greater than that as well. So that's some of the things that uh, I work on. And I wanted to show you a quick trailer of a festival so to give you a feel for kind of the ideas, the conversations that we wanted to have. Because one of the biggest things that we wanted for a festival is not just to be partisan, right? We didn't want it along party lines. We wanted it to be about what makes the world a little better, you know? And that can mean a lot of different things, right? Is it education? Is it many, you know, whether the world ends in 2012 at the end of this year? Whether that's so many other different types of things, access to clean water, what are the issues that are affecting our communities right in front of us or 10 miles away or five miles away from us? And what are the issues and how are they connected with the issues abroad and international? internationally. Alright. So here's one of our festival trailers to just go towards that. Uh, sorry if you can't hear the value. We'll just stick the microphone next to the speakers. Uh, get caught, I've done this before. Okay. It's directional. Okay. Charlie lights? No, no, just leave it. Leave it. Okay. 
short video. bit of the imagery that we're trying to show with the festival is uh, people of all different places, all different colors, sizes, issues, and really try to focus on what's going to make the world better, um, what are some of the idealistic things that we can do today. Because one of the things in terms of our festival um, are things as ideas with action. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing, how do we provide platforms and institutions and organizations like yourselves to be able to further that change? Whether people uh, jump on and become a part of it, and how do we measure ourselves by as a festival of how successful we are? You know, what are the metrics that we put in place to say, all right, is it just a bunch of people getting excited about something, or did we really affect change? Um, and that's kind of the challenge for what our festival is. So, in terms of our mission statement, um, our mission statement is to provide a forum for films that heighten public consciousness and provide support for their production. So once again, we felt that by having a forum, by having a platform where we can showcase so many different films, we can also be able to inspire others to say, well, maybe I'm not James Cameron and I'm not going to come out with the next Avatar, but maybe I could film the issues that are taking place in the, my community. And as a filmmaker, just to be able to see just how powerful film is, to be able to tell stories. People don't really read anymore. People watch videos um, in many ways. But how do we take that energy from somebody saying, well, dang, these, this group is marginalized, this group is, needs help, and all these different issues are taking place. What do I do about it? Um, one of the more powerful films that we received was one of children born with HIV AIDS. And it's one thing to read in The Economist to talk about how many children are, are facing this issue. You can say millions of uh, children, and you can read about it, but one thing to see the students, to see um, kids three and four years old to have to take the amount of drugs that they have to take to be able to live, uh, and the parents that have to try to convince their kids to actually take those drugs, and they don't really understand why, and all of those different issues. I mean, it's one of those things where you say, wow, I knew this issue existed, but to be able to see it made very, very powerful. So those kind of films are the films that we received. And I'll get into a little bit more about just the amount of films that we've received, but we've received films from over 43 countries, about 250 films in total. Um, films all the way from uh, Iraq, Iran, um, Africa, different countries in Africa, um, a lot domestically, Chicago, all over the place. And it's just been a great learning experience with some of the different issues and things that I had no idea about. You know, it's one thing to read it, and, um, but it's another thing to see it. So that's what we wanted to do in kind of the void that we were trying to fill. Um, one of the things in terms of taking a look at why we do this, right, is we're a 100% volunteer organization. We receive no money from this, and we're amazed at just how many volunteers, how many people that are a part of what we think is a movement in our own way. Do we think we're going to solve all the world's, world's problems with our president? Absolutely not. But we think that we can move the bar a little bit forward. We think that, you know, for a second festival that'll be next year, we can say, hey, these are some of the bullet points, these are some of the metrics, these are some of the things that we were able to advance forward because of our cause. So one, we want to give a voice and exposure to issues that are relevant to our communities. Just as this forum, you know, lots of people talking about these issues, you know, and not talking about it in a partisan way, which is so, I guess, contentious nowadays, you know, where it's about people. It's about what unifies us all and not necessarily what drives us apart. Um, foster discourse regarding the social issues. One, we want to be able to educate. There's a lot of people doing great work on the front lines who are affecting change in the communities they represent. We wanted to be able to show them to some other people that are doing great work, and perhaps they can collaborate together. 
And in terms of kind of my background in technology, business, nonprofit, for-profit world, you know, I wanted to bring all these people together and as best as we possibly can. Because one of the things just from being in the tech community, um, technology community, some say, hey, I want to be able to affect change with my programming skills. But they don't know, they necessarily know who to connect with. How can they help? And all those different things that go in towards being able to affect change with technology. That's part of our program that we're going to be able to have. So once again, we want to be able to have these conversations, get people talking and seeing what are the actionable opportunities that in fact exist. We want to increase the profile of films and filmmakers who produce films that promote social change. So for us, we wanted to inspire a whole group of people to say, you know what, I'm not going to be a filmmaker full time, but this is an issue that I want to be able to talk about, that I want to be able to showcase. And we've had several filmmakers that have presented films, that have showcased films for us, and we've just been amazed at some of the, the progress and some of the issues that they've been able to outline. Um, we also want to be able to show ways for um, companies, for organizations, social responsible organizations, social entrepreneurship, ventures, um, organizations, nonprofits. We wanted to give them another platform to once again be able to uh, talk to another demographic or a different industry um, about some of the different issues that are taking place. And lastly, we wanted to just you know, connect these unconnected networks that take place and really be able to uh, provide positive exposure for all the great things that are taking place. We're a highly idealistic organization, um, and we, we don't even apologize for that. We felt, feel that you know, we all are doing great things in many different ways, and we want to be able to connect each other, and that's why we exist. Once again, there's so many other types of organizations, and we wanted to be that one organization from a film standpoint to highlight these issues. So once again, we don't want to just showcase a film, have everybody excited and say, you know, the world is messed up. We really wanted to have that actionable component. What are the organizations that are doing this work? Can they talk about the work that they're doing? And the last step, what are, what are some of those bullet points that we can be able to use moving forward that will be a great for um, affecting change? So we also know with that we're not naive, right? <laughs> we don't think so. We are in certain cases. So one of the things that we notice is that um, in terms of affecting change, it wouldn't be effective if we got all the people that care about social change to be a part of this because we felt like that doesn't necessarily accomplish our goal. If we can get people that are kind of on the fence that say, yes, I want the world to be better, but I don't know how to, I don't know what are the issues, I don't know what I need to do, we want to get those people to say, you know what? I'll actually be able to attend this event because there's something interesting for me. So in addition to the actual showcasing the films, the panel discussions, workshops, and all those things that we have, we're also bringing in entertainment avenues in addition to that. So we're having a fashion show, showing eco-friendly clothing. And um, the fashion show um, is a reality show star who has done some great work. And once again, we want to showcase the work that she's doing. Also being able to highlight all the different films that talk about eco-friendly clothing and all those different things. So once again, maybe not your t traditional form that you would see with film and film festivals, but once again, another opportunity where somebody might say, hey, I'm interested in fashion. Maybe I'll come check it out. And then hopefully we engage them and we'd be able to kind of take that energy and being able to move something forward. So it's a three-day film festival that's October 5th through 7th, which is going to be at the Showplace Icon Theater, which is in South Loop, Chicago. Um, we're going to showcase short film, short films, documentaries, narratives. We even got a couple of animated features that were submitted. Surprisingly good. Um, so once again, not anything from Pixar, but something that is at the same time that is a, that is a pretty interesting as well. We're going to have a panel discussions, roundtables, moderated discussions, and once again, keep those conversations going, but also bring in that next step of actionable opportunities. And I saw when you guys are doing announcements, there were actionable opportunities, and we want to really be able to take that energy and be able to make change. Um, also, we're going to have filmmaking workshops for the, um, two of the days, where those that are interested in learning about film, they might say, you know what, I don't, want, I don't necessarily have $100,000 to invest in a college degree uh, to learn about film, but for two days, for $100, maybe I can get a, uh, a boot camp event. Perhaps that is something that might be able to get me over the fence to say I want to learn something new about this. So what we're going to do is position this in the framework of actual um, social change and documentary filmmaking and all those things in hopes that some people say, you know what, I want to showcase these issues.
Um, so we have a bunch of different news outlets that are going to cover us, and it's important to us to be able to have this because, once again, we want others to know about all the different things that are taking place that are nonpartisan. It doesn't have to be a partisan issue all the time. It could be about people, and that's the framework that we take. So um, if we take a look, I mean, if you take a look at our website, see our guest speakers, I think it's kind of like the dream team of social change in many ways, and we're excited about that. But I think that it wouldn't be helpful if we just show great people who've done a bunch of phenomenal things. We want to show aspiring people with burgeoning opportunities that are there doing great things, but at the beginning stages. So people can ask them questions. How did you get started? What are the things that pushed you over the head so you can say, you know what, maybe this is something I want to go and this is something that is going to make me fulfilled, and these are the issues that are important to me. So I um, talked about the um, whole aspect of action with ideas, which is uh, very important for us, is not just talking about it, but what are some of the actual steps that we can that can take place. In addition to that, we've had over 250 films submitted from over 43 countries, and we are beyond surprised at the amount of films that we've received. And you know, a lot of the filmmakers that we've spoken to, they say, you know what, thank you for creating this festival, because we don't have many places, many venues to showcase this, right? AMC is not going to show, you know, a, uh, a film about uh, uh, war crimes that take place in some part of the country when Dark Knight Returns is uh, going to be uh, grossing so much money. So once again, we want to provide that avenue and provide that platform so others can be able to showcase those issues. Some of the popular topics that are going to actually be, you know, sub things within our festival. One is homelessness. Um, an issue in, that is really taking on a life of its own in terms of the amount of films we've received, the amount of people that are speaking, the amount of opportunities to affect change, and we really are excited about that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, women's empowerment and entrepreneurship. Uh, we've had films that talk about women becoming entrepreneurs some of the, all over the world, here in the United States. In addition to just not just showing the film, there's so many different organizations that are going to be there to really showcase all the different ways in which women here in the United States and across the globe can be able to start their own businesses and be able to receive all the support and guidance that is out there. So we've been surprised at just the uh, volume of films we receive on that particular topic. Another one is clean water. Um, once again, it's one of those things where you can see, you can you know, read about the fact that X percent of the uh, world does not have access to clean water, but to see exactly all the steps that go that these you know, children who are going fetching water and being able to try to boil the water and how much wood that they're using to burn it and all those other issues that take place. It's pretty, pretty dynamic to see that once again. And it's, uh, we have a couple different actionable opportunities that we're going to be doing with that. Um, climate change is another thing we can see films with. Uh, poverty, economic development, sustainability. All those things are great things. And, you know, we're excited about the films that we're in fact receiving. So in addition to that, once again, we're trying to be able to go after a bunch of different demographics that may not necessarily be closely aligned. And that's what makes us excited about this festival. As I mentioned before, the fashion show. My sister it may not necessarily be the most social change-minded individual, but at the same time, for a fashion show, she said she'll be there. And that's that's kind of you know what we hope. We say, all right, you know what, once you're there, we're going to tell you a little bit about social change, and maybe you're not going to be the biggest evangelist for what it is we're doing, but maybe you've learned something. Maybe you can introduce somebody that you know who's passionate about this to someone else. And being able to bridge those communities and bridge those contacts together are very important to us. We're going to have a hackathon, and if you don't know what a hackathon is, it's not you know breaking into the government's database and doing something illegal. It's actually the opposite. Um, so we're having a hackathon, which is pretty much a 24 to 48 hour intense experience where computer programmers gather in a room in, in teams of four and five, and they actually are coming together with an application about um, that we're going to be using for the different organizations that are signed up with us. So we have community partners and organizations that are doing great work. They may not necessarily have the tech support, or may not necessarily have the platforms to be able to um, have innovation take place. So in that 48-hour period, it's kind of like a 48-hour intense innovation opportunity. And not everything that they create in that 48 hours is going to be used 10 years from now, but some of the different ideas of being able to do it quickly and vigorously in teams and judging that is going to bring the tech community together. And 
interesting enough, there's no hackathons that take place about social change. And that's what we're excited about, bringing in those nonprofits and organizations and go to them and be able to say, hey, this is what this organization provided that you can use to advance your agenda for your nonprofit, for your agenda. So once again, about helping people ultimately at the end of the day. We have a design-a-thon. So for design students who are interested in you know, being able to create cool posters and things of that nature, same exact concept except for design students. 48 hours, very short amount of time, judged by a panel of experts, and once again, being able to bring that innovation in a very short amount of time to bring some cool ideas. Because sometimes with creative folks, and me consider myself a creative folk every once in a while, um, the challenge is you know, finishing a product. Because we want to say, you know what, it has to be perfect. And sometimes done is better than perfect. Um, and that's kind of what these 48 hours is uh, an opportunity for. So we're doing the same thing for film. So filmmakers, you know, in, here in the city will have an opportunity to compete and come up with a video, two to three minute video for a select nonprofit. And it's the whole experience. It's an experience, an opportunity, galvanizing uh, opportunity in the sense where they're working together to try to solve problems, to showcase a particular problem. And that's the thing that makes us excited. And that's what we're joining all these different communities, all these different organizations together. Because once again, that experience, I think, is going to be powerful in being able to bridge those gaps. We also have a civil rights opera that's going to take place. So once again, you know, thinking outside of the box and being able to, uh, once again, cater towards a different demographic, make something interesting and unique and not just recreating the will. Um, those are some of the different engagement opportunities that are entertainment, that at the same time we have some uh, uh, some prizes with that and different musical events and we're going to actually be launching a couple of different new technology products as well during the festival so we're excited about that so our whole idea is that we're launching a bunch of stuff stuff that's going to we're going to be working on from today tomorrow um, up until the next festival that once again from a volunteer 100 percent volunteer organization we're going to be excited about um, here are some of our featured speakers. I'm not going to go through all of these folks, but um, I think in many ways they're just uh, a very powerful bunch. From Gordon Quinn, who is the co-founder of Cartoon Queen Films and created the film Interrupters. Uh, there's a house they created, Hoop Dreams, and a bunch of other social change type films. So, once again, to have him involved is, is a great opportunity for us because you know, this is uh, so many different powerful films that are coming out of that film production company. And, you know, if they're based in Chicago, we got to have them in there. We have uh, Jeff Hoffman, who was one of the founders of Priceline.com. We have um, Dave Tolchinsky, who is the chairman of Northwestern University's Department of Film. We have folks um, from our professors. We have the director of Groupon Grassroots. We have all these different type of organizations, different type of people, different fields, catering towards different audiences that once again can make this that idealistic uh, uh, event. And you know, we have so many others. I invite you to check out our website. I brought some literature here if you want to check us out. More information, I'd love to uh, pass it out as well. Um, so just to tell you about two of the kind of premier um, films that we're going to be showcasing. One is called Homestretch. Um, it's a film done by Cartoon Point Films. And it's going to be a sneak peek. So it's the first time that their film is actually being shown to the public is going to be at a festival that we're excited about. So the film pretty much showcases students in the Chicago public school system that are homeless. And these students that are homeless and some of the different things that they go through to try to be successful. They're jumping from house to house, home to home, and trying to, at the same time, study. So it's one thing to say, hey, our students aren't learning. But it's another thing to see just a, a growing population of students that are not necessarily receiving all the care and services that they need to be successful long term, which affects us in many different ways. You know, when you think about the civil rights movements and all these other movements, a lot of the issues that received attention were because internationally they were looked at and you know that put a lot of different pressure. So there's a lot of different elements that we want to be able to showcase and being able to see and I just think that that's going to be powerful. So we're happy to have them. Um, in terms of uh, seeds, which is another um, Film that we're going to be showing. So it talks about micro lending um, in different women entrepreneurs all over the world. And the powerful thing about this is, um, you know, with the Jobs Act being passed or on its way to being implemented in some kind of way, one of the one of the important things for the tech community, at least, is the opportunity to be able to fund entrepreneurial ventures through microfinance. 
which is like Kickstarter for startups is going to take place. So you see all these different organizations that are out here that are that are trying to position themselves to become that platform that we use to be able to fund different ventures. So how do we raise money for starting up a company? You know, from friends, family, and fools, right? We pretty much go around and ask people and say, hey, can you give me $25 here, $100 here, $1,000 there? And before we know it, we come together, we have $15,000 and maybe our credit cards to be able to get that business off the ground. So this is going to take place on a much larger scale come April or May of next year. So once again, we're showcasing how this has been able to be successful and some of the different drawbacks that take place all across the world in these different developing nations for women entrepreneurs. But in addition to that, we're going to show, hey, what are the implications for our communities here, for our children, for our families, for our, the people that we know? What are some of the things that we need to know about that particular act? So once again, that brings in that whole understanding of what's taking place across the world, What's taking place in the United States? What are the implications for us? And what are the things that we can do right now? So another thing in terms of uh, home stretch by our template, one of the actionable opportunities, we're going to be soft launching a, a homeless shelter for women. So once again, there's a woman entrepreneur who's one of my former female entrepreneur who's one of my former students, and she mentioned, you know, I wanted to start this venture, but I need to get some energy behind it, some people behind it, and. And she, at one point, was uh, homeless herself while she was going through school and trying to make some different things work. And this is a very passionate project for her. So once again, from that actionable component, we want to say, hey, how many dollars are we able to raise because of the festival for this organization? How many volunteer hours will we able to generate? We also want to see, hey, what are some of the other things from a, it is from a policy standpoint, from a... Uh, actionable you know, steps, what are those metrics that need to be put in place that everyone can participate and gather around? Even if it's just once a month for one hour, how many hours can we generate of activity taking place? And that's what we're excited about. Um, so, you know, um, one of the, the theories that I have is when you present in front of a group, you get out as soon as you possibly can and, uh, and answer some questions in case you lost the group. So one of the things in terms of we wanted to sh you know, share with the organizations that you're a part of, the organizations that you know of, the networks that you're a part of, you know, how can you participate? To be a community supporter with our particular organization in terms of promoting the causes that you're working on and some of the different things, it's free. You know? So we've been able to sign up about 75 different organizations that are um, with the leader of the statement and that we're actually helping within our festival itself. So, so if you know of organizations that want to get free promotion, part of you know everything that we're doing in terms of being able to showcase it, we'd love for you to come up and let me know so I can definitely get you integrated. Obviously, if you want to give me a check for a million dollars, I'll take that too. Um, but um, that normally doesn't work. So um, also, what we're trying to do is essentially create different fundraising opportunities for nonprofits and social entrepreneurial ventures. So one of the partnerships that we have is Groupon and Grassroots, which is a part of their platform which helps raise money for socially responsible organizations. So they're going to actually give us a technology platform that we're going to be able to use as part of the festival to generate all of that awareness, time, money, and all those things going on. So once again, another great partner, publicly traded company, that once again was originated from the roots of social change. Uh, to be a part of what it is that we're doing, so we're excited about that. So everyone here, you know, how can you participate? Spread the word, you know, let as many people know about what it is we're doing. Um, if you're interested, I have a great discount code for anybody here that you can use or that um, in terms of being a part of the festival or being a part of everything that's going on. Um, it's important to us really to have participation and those that are really passionate about making a difference in the communities we represent. Um, we have a Kickstarter campaign that's about to close, so we almost raised all the money that we need for the festival, which we're excited about. We've done a bunch of different buzz building events. We've donated a ton of blood from, with the Red Cross. We've done everything from poetry events. And um, really try to be as dynamic in the type of venues and the type of uh, places we've had. And, you know, we've taken some informal polls on some of the different people that have come out. And because we have them in non-traditional places to watch a film and being able to interact and have conversations, We've been able to have a tremendous amount of people that have come out because they're not typical. Um, in a sense where if you watch a film, we're looking at the back of everybody's head and we're watching a film. And then afterwards, we go home and say, wow, that film was great, or I was moved. There's nothing I can do about it, and that energy is left. 
So once again, we want to take that opportunity, gather all that energy, transfer that energy so that once again, we can have some actionable steps. So if you know of any nonprofits, organizations, social entrepreneurial ventures that would love to be a part of us, you know, we would love to talk to you guys. Um, probably talk to you all too much about what it is that we're doing, but we're beyond passionate of what it is that we're doing. And once again, we're 100% volunteer. So uh, we get no money from this, but we're passionate. And that's really important to us that as no one receiving any compensation, that we're all about trying to advance the mission of our organization. So other than that, um, also attend, please, <laughs> which is, uh, that would be great as well. So I guess if, unless you have any questions, that's it for me. Oh. All right. I think you do have some questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, we'll start with Joe Mayer. Uh, what and when was the impetus to start this operation? Yes. So it was literally I wanted to showcase my students, and I wanted to be able to show because for one to tell the story to our um, people who are grantors and the people that are giving us money. We want to be able to showcase, you know, what are the, what this is the progress because there's so many people can, you know, competing for the same donation dollars, right? So as a filmmaker, I want to tell a story to showcase these students from when they started to when they finished. Where some of our students have been so. Uh, spectacular in the growth process that they're even better than some of our instructors after just a year. And it's just amazing in their, uh, their ability to pick up this information so fast. So because of that, I'm going to showcase that and I just didn't have venues to be able to do that. And it was just simple as saying, and my philosophy is if you, there's no place to do it, I'm going to create one. And I probably was not even thinking that it wouldn't be that much work, you know. I thought, hey, yeah, it'd be one day, we go there, and at the end of the day, you know, we'll do something small. And then just the amount of support and people that are with us, we said, hey, we just got to continue to make this thing bigger and better. Uh, you, Ingrid? Uh, I'm wondering, um, are, are, are you still taking submissions for, uh, for films, or is this in the books? Yeah, our last day is August 15th. So... Um, but I think that uh, if it's something that's really important, we'll take a look at it. Absolutely. Okay. And how how um, does one submit? Bob Matter? I can talk about yeah, it's through, through our website or um, without a box, which is Amazon's platform. And, but if you go to our website, there's a link to say this. Yes. Bob? Uh, are, um, are, are you getting any government funding? state or federal uh, government funding, or is this all just private donations and volunteers? Yeah. This is about as guerrilla and volunteers as we're receiving no grants or anything to this point. It's important for us to try to distance ourselves from a lot of different, so we only receive different types of money from different types of places, because once again, in the sense of transparency and making sure we're as um, yeah. idealistic as possible, we haven't done anything with that at all. Yeah, uh, being that uh, Apple is such a secretive corporation, um, I wonder how in the world, are you talking about apps for the Apple iPhone that these students, are, how in the world uh, do they get access to the proprietary language, and then how in the world, I, I've heard that you can't really submit to Apple, I mean almost everything, it's almost impossible to get anything through them. Uh, and then, they have all sorts of uh, barriers, so how, how is this possible that students can have, have any chance against, uh, you know, everybody else? The challenge with Apple is, they say you can't submit anything that challenges something that they already do. So, for instance, if they came up with their own search engine, we couldn't create a search engine app and being able to put it on an iPhone itself. So they have a lot of restrictions because they don't want you competing with them in any capacity, which is anti-competitive, which is evil if you ask certain people. It, you know, stalls innovation and all those things. But with Google's Android platform, in fact, anything and everything goes through. So 100% of our students have submitted an app, and we teach them how to create the app. We, they go through an intense. 39-week um, process where they learn about creating apps, but 100% of our students have created apps. Their average SAT math score has increased by 110 points. Um, in addition to that, uh, just they feel like leaders in their community. And it's interesting to see that everybody in their school can download this app that they're doing. And so it's kind of that, I come from a sports background. I played baseball in high school and college a little bit afterwards. 
And one of the things is, you know, we really try to keep a real sports dynamic to it in terms of group teams, being able to go in different competitions throughout the city, and our students have won a bunch of different awards. So that's um, the powerful thing about that. But the Android platform is a lot easier. So we test, we teach them at first to create on the Android platform because they won't deny anything. I mean, and then after that, we move towards the Apple platform. So they can't get the proprietary language from Apple. Oh yeah, everybody has access to the markup language that gives you that foundation to do it. There's a lot of stuff that they keep behind the curtains, um, but at the same time, there's uh, anybody and everybody. There's millions and millions of apps that are out there. Oh yeah, all right, sir. Okay. Uh, what a first of all, excellent idea to get people to think in terms of the whole picture fulfilled. Um, what are the categories of the subjects that you are going to cluster in your, the films during the, um, the festival? And um, I wonder, I, I like the idea that you want to stay independent by not receiving too many funds from uh, organizations, especially corporations, but um, is there any censorship that you guys feel compelled to um, to install or um, are you going to alienate anybody or are you careful to not to appeal to people? How do you deal with this issue? Yeah, no, that's a phenomenal question actually. Um, I'll touch on that. So one of the things is we have a film selection committee made up of very diverse people, different backgrounds, and what we wanted to do is Everybody has an equal vote of what films should be represented. Um, and that's important to us because, once again, some issue that might be considered social change for me may not be for someone else. I mean, we've had several different discussions, and everybody votes independently on the different films. We make sure for every film they get at least five votes from different people before we put them in a category of seeing which ones are going to be able to hit our ranks of films that are going to be submitted. But we don't have any censorship whatsoever, and that's kind of our goal. And I think you know one of the other issues is marriage equality is one of the films uh, categories I've got to put on the list that we are going to be able to highlight as well. So once again, we really wanted to make sure we don't make it the J.P. Morgan or the Chase Social Change Film Festival. We wanted to make sure that this That's is... That's for sure. But I, I wonder, let's say there is a film that offends the church, you know, like a dog, it's the God delusion. Uh, would you accept? A, a oh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we're trying to... The biggest challenge is trying to group all these in different categories without separating the ones that are kind of in between. But no, there's not one topic we won't address. Um, there's we've received a lot of films in you know uh, sexual freedom and you know that has some different graphic uh, types of imagery. Um, and one of the challenges that we had is you know we didn't want to censor that stuff that might be offensive. So it's our job to educate that group of folks that are going to possibly see that film of, hey, these are the types of issues that are being represented and being very transparent about. It might, you know, not suitable for kids, maybe, or not, it, you make that choice for yourself, as opposed to us making that decision for you. And how do you cluster them? Yes, so we're clustering them in terms of, um, we have five different categories that we rate everything from quality of the film, educational value, is this a social change film is important, the quality of, from a technical audio standpoint, and then the last one is, you know, is there a call to action in some part of aspect of the film? So we take that, that's our first step, and the second step that we do after that is, we try to say, okay, what are the top issues of categories that were defined by the directors and producers of the film? And we try to line up all the different films that were submitted under the different categories and see how many is too much, how many is too little. The great thing about this is we have so much flexibility. We can show seven different films under one different uh, genre or theme and being able to show them from different angles. So, for instance, with homelessness, we're able to show it from a documentary standpoint. We're able to show it from a narrative. Um, first person perspective. Um, we're showing it from a silent film perspective, right? We'll see from an animated perspective. So once again, they all have different ways of going about addressing the issue. Let's see. I, I, oh, David Sucker. Are you going to be showing just new films, or are you going to be showing old films as well? Um, a majority of the films that we received are new films. Um, but 
we felt that if the issues are relevant to today, um, we want to think about trying to showcase that. So for instance, we're going to be showing the interrupters, um, which has gotten a lot of press and a lot of people have seen it, especially in the social change film arena. But what we do is instead of just showing the film, we're going to do it one year after this, um, the interrupters. What is taking place? What has transpired? And what are some of the things that have happened? So we're actually bringing in the team that's the technology team for that interrupters that are launching a new web application to go along with the film. So once again, you're seeing the film that many people have already seen, but at the same time, connecting that towards the technology platform to really solve that problem, or try to solve that problem, I should say. Now, uh, are the submitters uh, also the voters on the project? Of course. No, no, the submitters of the film, they're wherever they are in the part of the world, and we, we, we have no interaction. Who are the voters? They're people on our advisory Party board, um, no. people that are part of our oh. volunteers, and okay. we do that in turn. We have a selective advisory board. Yes, we have our advisory board and everything, but yes. we're always welcome to bring in more people. <laughs> yes. Gene? Uh, maybe you, uh, you introduce your speech, but I didn't get it. Uh, right. But I think your approach is two ways to uh, take an issue and and, and, and expand on it and give that message that you intended to give. And one way is like a documentary <coughs> or, a, or factual, as much as you can be factual in the research you did in order to put it together. The other way that you, that you convey an issue is, is, is like the courts do it, or like Voltaire did. And you're talking about an issue, but you're uh, content is really, uh, really fictional. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, we have both kinds. So that's what I mean in terms of like the narrative and uh, fictional stories. So we have a ton of those. And that's what I'm excited about. Because there's documentary film festivals, but we wanted to say, hey, can you show homelessness from creating, bringing some actors and being able to showcase these issues? And does that tell as compelling of stories of documentary? And we've had many cases where the narrative, the narrative has told the story better than the documentary. So that's the powerful thing about being able to merge those two. So you, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. All right, uh, Charlie? Yeah, I'm uh, curious exactly how you define social change. And the reason I asked it, because you got all this stuff about entrepreneur and people who start a business to make money for themselves. And if I made a movie about Sam Walton, that Ozark mountain boy, <laughs> starting a business, are you going to put it in your festival? So. No. Well, I mean, it's social change, right? Yeah, well, see, that's the nice thing about a diverse panel. Because for me, I don't actually say, well, the story of Walmart is not a social change panel. What is entrepreneurship, incipient capitalism, have to do with social change? Are you 99% or 1%? Well, at least from my personal view, I'm the 99%. For sure, I don't have that kind of money at all, you know. And nor do I really want that kind of money. But, you know, the reason that we're saying is, for a lot of people, getting your traditional job is just not possible. You know, I know this with my students, for instance. My students, and the whole reason I started my youth project was because so many of my students have come to me and said, I cannot find a job. Do you know of anybody hiring? And, you know, I think that I know quite a bit of people, and I have no ways of being able to plug you into HR, marketing, accounting, those traditional fields. But if you want to be able to create, if you're a tech programmer, you're, you know, a, a computer uh, scientist, I have tons of them. You know, for my sister, for instance, she was trying to get a job doing a bunch of different things. She wanted to do marketing. I told her, you know, I learned this computer science thing. So she learned it after not being able to uh, get a job in marketing, and she was able to get 12 job interviews in a week and a half. And that's how much need is, is out there. So to answer your question, um, the whole idea is that the ability to sustain ourselves in different communities and different places all across the world is important because, once again, in terms of the economic cycle, if I'm able to generate some revenue and maybe I'm, you know, I'm not Sam Walton, I'm mom and pop shop around the corner, I can send my kids to school, I can be able to live a reasonable life, and, you know, one of the things that I always talk about in class is not everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants similar things in the sense where they want education, they want quality education, access to opportunities, they want, you know, 
I don't want to say it. decent health care, um, the ability to take care of themselves and being able to pass it down through generations. So for us, we're not going to showcase the Walmart story, but the person around the corner that couldn't get a job that is able to create <coughs> something that's a service to the community and the community at large, I think that's still, for me, social change. For others on our panel, they don't think so. You know, and that's the great thing about our diverse board and being able to see because some Entrepreneurial opportunities are better than others in terms of social change focus. Tim Bolger. All right. I, I, I know you're here representing the organization. Can you just give us a little bit about your background and perhaps maybe what your favorite movie is? Okay. Oh, get to know me. I like long walks on the beach and. No, I'm um, Yeah, so I grew up in Chicago, born and raised. Um, Went to public school up until seventh grade at Skinner Elementary School. I grew up in Little Italy, um, racing and Taylor. Um, I was originally born in the Lawndale neighborhood, um, and then moved to Racine and Taylor as uh, my dad became a resident. He's a doctor. Um, he was kicked out of his residency program. Um, he's an immigrant from Haiti. Um, grandparents from um, the Dominican Republic. Um, in addition to that, after going to Skinner Elementary School in the public school system, I went to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools high, um, for middle school and high school, um, played baseball, uh, went to the University of Chicago where I got my degree in economics. Uh, I taught calculus in college, I played baseball for four years, uh, created a couple different patents. Um, worked on a couple different things. And after and during college, I also interned with uh, at the time, State Senator Barack Obama, um, this is 2000 to 2002, um, and then I continued working with him a year afterwards. Um, after that, I moved to J.P. Morgan Chase, did investment banking, realized large corporate America wasn't for me, I um, did that for four years, and decided I wanted to go back to school, got my MBA at Northwestern University. Uh, after that, I ran an accounting firm, um, a family-owned business, so small business and entrepreneurship is important to me for that reason. Being able to turn around that company, it had a lot of client attrition and a lot of different issues from that. Um, got into film, started a couple different companies, sold one company, um, and yeah, that's kind of where I am today. So why do you What's your favorite movie? Yeah. Oh, um, my favorite movie, I'm a big fan of... I like, uh, I like action movies. Okay. And, um, I like Gladiator, I like Fight Club, Counterculture. Uh -huh. um, something that where we can still entertain you, but at the same time give you a message. And whether you agree with it or disagree with it, we're giving you a message and to be able to understand it. Okay. Uh, Joe Mayer? Uh, could you tell us something about your experience as a filmmaker? What kind of films were they? Were they educational? <coughs> were they for social change? Or were they... Uh, entertainment. Yes, so my film that's on HBO, it's a uh, entertainment, it's a drama, it's about, but it has some issues that I think are socially worthy. Um, it's about two guys looking for opportunity, but instead of looking to the, um, somebody else to give it to them, they take it upon themselves. So it's inspired by the play Waiting for Godot by uh, um, Samuel Beckett, and from that we just took a contemporary take on that, and that's, um, we shot it in the Bronx. Uh, Amazing place, um, but we found out it was the most dangerous corner on the Bronx. You know, it was an interesting experience because the community was like, they wanted to jump in the film, they wanted to hand us their headshots, the, the, the police that were there, they were upset that we were there because of the amount of violence that were there, and they were worried about our protection, despite the fact we had permits and our own security teams and everything there in place. Um, and there was other folks that were mad because they didn't want us to show the community a bad light and everybody from reporters that showcased that community. So I thought it was kind of social change from a different aspect. It's all about creating your own opportunity. What's the most dangerous uh, corner of the Bronx? Yeah, it was where we happened to shoot it. But, um, well, there had been a couple killings there the week before. Um, it was the exact address. I just know it was Mariano's Deli right outside. It was uh, outside of Bodega. <laughs> That was about oh, two years ago. Oh, the concourse. No, I don't know New York too well. I just kind of showed up and we started shooting. Okay. A follow-up real quick. Uh, what? How long, when, after you film the film, how long does it take you to edit? And what editing platform do you use? 
Yeah, so because we don't have a ton of money, which we did this, this is very guerrilla and asking for money from friends, families, and fools. Um, we pretty much just uh, took about six months to revise the script because uh, we were all working full time in our different capacities. We shot the film, took us about a week. We edited for about three months um, because of, it just took that long. We used Adobe Premiere uh, for as our editing platform and. Then we just started submitting to festivals. We didn't, I didn't know anything too much about the festival process. I've never been classically trained in filmmaking. And so we just shot them out to as many as we could, got some good responses, made it to Cannes, um, some great places, and from that we moved forward. Right, Ayala? Are you going to have uh, discussions after the films? Absolutely, discussion after the films. Um, we, after each film? Absolutely. absolutely. And what, With what the audience, films? right? Yes. So the audience participate as Q&A, but also some facilitated discussions that take place as well. So do could some of the directors or producers, oh. were they able to come in? Yes. I mean, uh, quite a bit. Uh, one of the questions that we had is when you submit a film, is there a chance that you would be able to come? And that doesn't affect the way we grade them, but a good, a good percentage are actually going to be able to come. Yeah, nice. They just want to be able to tell the story because there's nowhere to tell it. Yeah. Do it, yes. are, there, are there prizes for best films, or maybe they just Yeah, well, awards. this is something we've been uh, going back and forth. We do have an award ceremony. We're recognizing certain people that are doing great things in the community. We're recognizing like the winners of the Hackathon, the Designathon, and the 48-hour film competition. We don't. Um, we're trying to figure that out when we have awards because how do you judge a social change film? And that's the biggest thing that I try to decide because one issue is going to be more entertaining than others. Some are going to be shot with high quality cameras with big budgets. You know, I just have a personal problem with awards with these kind of films. Uh, Bob Matter. Yeah, does, uh, does the National Endowment for the Arts uh, do they fund any, any filmmakers? Yes, they fund a significant amount of filmmakers. Um, uh, for instance, the film Home Stretch about the homeless uh, students in the Chicago public schools. They uh, receive funding from the MacArthur Foundation, some other films that receive funds from like the Cormac Foundation. There are a lot of foundations that do in fact provide well, funding. Now, that, now the National Endowment for the Arts, well, that's, a, that's a government fund, uh, uh, or taxpayer fund thing, isn't it? Uh, from my understanding, yes. Okay. How, what's your opinion on, on the government Doing those kind of roles. Yeah. I knew he was a tough crowd. I was worried about those questions. So we'll see. Yeah. Absolutely. So obviously, there's a lot of different sides to this. I'm not going to get too diplomatic. I'll give my opinion. Um, my thing is that arts is something that is losing relevance in terms of the eyes of receiving funding for schools, organizations, and people. And I think art is as important towards the development of kids, and people, and being able to express themselves as learning computer science. I think that they're very important. And the challenging thing is those are the programs that are seemingly the first to cut because you can't quantify that with SAT math instruction. It's just very difficult to have that direct link. So I think it's important that as long as they have a certain set of criteria that do make the world better, um, but you have a lot of filmmakers that need to receive funding to tell a lot of great stories. You need a lot of people who are trained to have something to do, um, which is important, in my opinion, because once again, maybe not everybody turns into the um, hoop dreams or the interrupters, but perhaps they help kind of provide a gateway to the next step, which might be able to affect change. So I'm in support of that because I feel as if these people, these organizations, don't have enough resources and Although it doesn't necessarily translate into a computer science, technology, Groupon platform, I think it's still important. I've got a related follow-up question. Well, with funding, uh, 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 how is uh, how are these programs like Kickstarter and stuff? Are they are they funding filmmakers now? You know, and is, is that are they meeting the needs? Are they able to meet the needs of filmmakers? <laughs> In some ways, yes, in some ways, no, uh, to 
to be totally um, diplomatic about it. But Kickstarters provides a great platform for us, for me, to reach out to friends and family and close acquaintances to be able to raise money. The challenging thing now is I think there's a lot of Kickstarter fatigue that takes place because everybody has a Kickstarter campaign, right? And there's so many different people that have great ideas, great opportunities, and Yes, they are, some are getting funded and many aren't. And maybe that's kind of that survival of the fitness of the best projects as well. Um, they are meeting some of the needs, but are they meeting 100% of the needs? No. Uh, Diane? Yeah. Uh, how did you go about procuring submissions for this? You said it was the first social change. It was kind of the first festival that's typed. Absolutely. So, and you mentioned like getting 250 films, 43 countries, something like that. Um, how did you raise awareness to get submissions, and did you find that most of these people were already working on this film or this topic, and then found that it fit into this outlet? Absolutely. So Amazon has a platform called Without a Box, um, which is a centralized database where you can go if you want to submit your film to as many festivals as you possibly can. So it pretty much lists all the different festivals based on genre, length, criteria, so on and so forth. So that makes it so much easier. We pay like a ton of money to get signed up, but they funnel a lot of films our way. And for a first time festival, there's no way we would have received anywhere close to the volume of films. Um, so what we did is bring in our interns and our volunteer staff literally reached out to a bunch of different filmmakers and different organizations, different people, and said, hey, we have this film festival, Sh showcase your film. And we actually mined Kickstarter and Indiegogo to see what type of films are being made, or have been made, or will be made, or just need funding, and said, hey, submit to our festival too, as part of you know what your opportunities are represent. So that's how, another way we were able to procure so many different. But it was very guerrilla, very a pull strategy for sure. Charles? Yeah, you know, you know, over the years we've had speakers here at the college who talked on topics we'd never heard about. Do you have, I don't know how to say this, are there any films exposing an issue that is not, like, we know about homelessness. I mean, are there any Brand new cutting edge things that the lefties are putting out there these days? Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I mean, one of the films, uh, there's a couple that come to mind. There was one film in particular that's talking about economic development and the progress that's mm -hmm. taking place in Detroit, whether some people view it as progress or not progress is interesting. But they also compared it to a also town in Poland that is experiencing growth but five years later than, um, than Detroit. So was able to see that comparison between the two countries and being able to see um, what things are being done to, um, to create and stimulate an environment in which it was once in manufacturing, but now it's something else in technology and creative arts and all those things. We've also had some films that have talked about, um, for instance, in an island in the Caribbean, um, they talked about uh, creating their own sustainable chocolate factory as a way of trying to combat all the different injustices that takes place in Western Africa about, you know, children literally working for nothing and all the different killing and problems that are result from that. So rather than say, hey, we're going to send everybody to Western Africa and being able to combat this problem, they said, you know, we're going to take care of it in our own country. If we create sustainability here, that decreases the need and uh, reliance on stuff over there. So if more countries, and their call to action is that more of countries decided to work on sustainability in a way that generates profit but does it, but at the same time empowers the community, perhaps we can be all better off as opposed to just throwing aid at different problems as opposed to saying, hey, maybe you know we need to focus on our country as well too. All right. Well, uh, will there be a, a certain uh Prices for the admission and prices of the news that you could uh, provide in this? Yes, so I um, give you guys. 65% off, um, and that's the discount code I give to the organization that are part of what we're doing. Um, so yes, there's prices and we have different badges. Um, the films are everywhere from $6 to $11 per film, um, and discount code is important for the different organizations and different people as well. So it all ranges depending on the time and the type of film. Places? And in terms of um, the showplace icon. 
Where where, 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 where will it be? Where will the film be shown? Yes, at the Showplace Icon, which is a theater um, in the South Loop. It's a brand new, uh, m uh, amazing um, new theater. Okay, the North 150 West Roosevelt. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so uh, most of your submissions are like uh, uh, people that are doing these independent things, like the Blair Witch Project. You're trying to. Not, uh, <laughs> you're, cir you're circumventing the Hollywood model there. Um, Which one? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, we've had films of different levels of production quality. We've had ones that look like somebody we a million bucks for this film, and we have others that look like they're Blair Witch, fifteen dollar type of film. So we see a range, um, and the challenging thing is, you know, do they tell that compelling story? Is that something where you're going to be inspired? Is it going to look big, good on the big screen? Because just because you shoot it on your flip cam doesn't mean on a huge jumbo screen that it's going to look as good. So those are some issues that we have to take into account as well. So it's it's a range, um, it's the range, but. Um, I, mean, I think, you know, if you guys get a chance to attend, uh, the quality of these films are a lot better than I thought they were going to be. I sit on the uh, board of a couple of different film festivals, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I will say that uh, I think our quality is a little bit better. What about nice. Lake Burke? Uh, since there's a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> film festivals already in Chicago, how, are you going, how do you uh, plan to publicize this to lure people away from the multiplex and the malls? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. So some, uh, in terms of the marketing efforts that we're actually going to be stepping up next week because we're going to make our final film selections public uh, at the end of the day tomorrow. So a crazy day tomorrow for us. Um, every different magazine, newspaper, we've reached out to already. They want to showcase us everywhere from CNN to Fox to local stations, local newspapers, magazines. But, you know, the most I think fulfilling part for me is to really be able to work with the different organizations that already have an installed base of uh, folks and being able to offer them an opportunity to be a part of it. So a lot of downstream push, but at the same time a little bit of a pull strategy with the different magazines and advertising methods as well. Tim Boulder. Um, as far as uh, <laughs> social change films and everything else come, what are some of the other organizations that you're affiliated with? And I noticed you, you know, some of your speakers there are some very high powered folks. How did you get them? And, and it just, you know, will these films be made available like on the internet or to purchase a DVD after the festival? Yes, yeah, so phenomenal questions. You guys have done this before, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it was a chicken and egg problem at first to get uh, good speakers at the um, festival because, once again, your first time, you know, we met with some people at first and said, hey, this is our festival, this is what we're doing, and they kind of said, no thanks, you know, let us know when you have somebody good on your panel. I respect what you guys are doing, um, but it was really reaching out to our networks and really telling the story as many times as we could. Um, to different people and once again you know some uh, folks that were on there um, they said you know I don't know if this is going to be big but we trust you because the mission is there the 100% volunteer organization was big for them so we don't have to pay the big honorariums which a lot of them were there so we don't have a $20,000 speaker budget whatsoever it's a lot of sad stories and say hey it's for the community this is how we're, what we're doing so that's how we're able to bring it. now this also may sound blatantly obvious but are you going to have videographers there to record the Q&A session after the presentation of the film? Absolutely. We'll be live streaming the entire event as well. So we have a couple different hosts that are going to be live streaming some of the different films, some of the different events for those that can make it or can't make it across the world. We want to showcase as much as we can and also put it on a website so we can show these are kind of the interesting, cool, innovative activities that we have. So just like you've done with the website, um, people want to be able to see that, and that really speaks volumes in terms of, you know, people don't read, they watch videos now. Well, I, I know with experience on myself, you know, just the process of movie making, some, uh, and even just putting something like this college online is, is a little bit more of a laborious experience. I mean, I do it all for free as the labor of love, but, you know, I, I know that, you know, if I'm to get more equipment, things like this, I gotta monetize it, maybe sell DVDs, things like this. Will the actual films be made available online or will you have like a 
a DVD repository, or is it just going to be through the production companies themselves? Yeah, so one of the challenging things with film is that there's so many different people that own these films or part owners. Mm -hmm. To get them all on the same page is, in a, is a reality show in itself. Um, I can't tell you, I mean, even the films I've done, mm -hmm. you're like, wow, I thought we were doing this for the love of the film, but as soon as some money comes into right. play, things get crazy. It's like playing Monopoly. All of a sudden you're playing a game, and then it's, it becomes serious. It's Monopoly. It's a game. But what we're going to do is for all the films that we, in fact, select and the films that we actually don't um, select, we're going to give them an option of, hey, we would love if you can stream it online. Maybe we can leave it up for one week, and you pay a $2 fee to see as many films as you want, or some kind of limited distribution opportunity. Because the biggest thing is, for a lot of these filmmakers, for social change films, they're not looking to get rich, right? right. Not, there's not going to be the dark night rises. What they're going to do is they're just hoping that 10,000 people see their film and see the work, and hopefully from there they can put that on the Kickstarter <laughs> campaign, right? So they can say, hey, this is why you need to fund our second film. So we're going to give that option open, and we hope that they take it. But to be perfectly honest, um, I think it's going to be probably around 10 to 15 percent that actually take that opportunity. Will you make Lash and then Bob Matter? From my own point of view, social change, and social reform, we can do that within capitalism. Social change involves taking a critical position to work out. And, and I'm wondering if um, I'm wondering if the if the festival is open to you know films that, that do actually uh, oppose capitalism and question it. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's, there's there's no doubt about that. I mean, we want every single angle, honestly. I mean, but we just want to make sure it's not the J.P. Morgan social change film festival. But we want films of you know we've had films of everything from conspiracy theories to What's wrong with the government? What's wrong with us? What's wrong with people? What's wrong with people that vote for different positions that are not in their economic interest? Like all those kind of films. So we want to spur those kind of conversations. We don't want it to be, you know, capitalism is great, the world is good, you know, let's, let me get rich and worry about the next person later. Uh, Bob Matter? Yeah, the, uh, the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, the African Diaspora Film Festival, the uh, the Chicago Documentary Film Festival. These these festivals have all been poorly attended, and, and I think the Chicago Documentary Festival folded. And Human Human Rights Watch, I think they, I think maybe running only every other year or something. Uh, what are you doing to reach out to get people into the theaters, or have you done some yeah. test marketing that you know that people are going to? see these things? Yeah, absolutely. And we've had a bunch of pre-sales thus far, which has indicated that we'll be okay. Um, I think the biggest way in which we need to differentiate ourselves is with an experience. If it's just showing films and you go home, then what? perhaps that's not really capturing that large mainstream audience yeah. so that you can be sustainable from a festival yeah. standpoint. And those festivals have all been to, and they've been great, because many of them haven't provided that experience component to it that some of the great well-attended festivals provide. Um, it's not just showcasing the film, you say, hey, see a film, be engaged, here's some action, and here's a fashion show, you know, and that is a way of really getting, reaching across different demographics, because if you're just pulling from the same people that believe the same thing as you, after a while they say, okay, I'm gonna see the same people I already know. What we want to do is what we're trying to sell is an innovative, different kind of an experience. All right. I got a follow-up question. Are you uh, reaching out to school? Are you having, are you having our teachers going to be bringing kids there on field trips and stuff? Questions. Because I'm so glad you mentioned that. I forgot to say we have a high school component as well. It's taking place September 8th and September 22nd, and the first day that they're talking about what social change means, they're talking about issues with identity, they're talking about issues of storytelling, and there's a whole workshop series around that that we have students and schools from all over the city who are going to be uh, attending that. On the 22nd, they're actually making a social change film that we're going to be showcasing them um, at the actual festival itself, so they can bring their parents and they can see that, hey, my film is shown across you know, right after a professional. So once again, it's really trying to reach in different types of demographics because it's, I think that's the way to be able to get a much larger base. Um, I've had a, a request of that we soon move uh, to the rebuttals because we have okay. a slimmer crowd tonight than uh, usual. Uh, Make mine the last question and then we'll be. Uh, if yeah, I see two hands raised. Uh, 
of three. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think we have time for three questions. So plenty of time. Uh, Doug Bentley. Uh, yeah, certainly. Bob Lickenberg. I just would like you to repeat, where is the Showplace Icon Theater? It's 150 West Roosevelt, and that's on uh, Roosevelt between State and Canal. In Chicago? Yes. Great old place. Hey, great. Yes. Oh, Big place right by a huge Target, Whole Foods. You know. yeah. uh, uh, the, so uh, I have a two, part, two questions. Uh, uh, what do you think film is a particularly good way to bring good art to bring about social change? in particular, and second, don't you think a lot of um, commercial films recently have been pandering to violence and have uh, resulted in, in uh, <clears throat> tragedy like in Aurora, Colorado recently. With, um, <clears throat> do you have any perspective on, on uh, that? Are you, what, what's, what's your view about if, that? If we go, will we be murdered? <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah, that's the goal is for safety here and as much safety as possible. But, yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, the thing is, film is a powerful force. And, I mean, in the unfortunate, senseless incident in Aurora, um, it's one of those things where it makes you question, you know, the value of this medium. Um, the, the, the artistic uh, merits in doing a Batman Returns where, you know, everybody's killing each other and you go home, right? And so, so, as long as you show special effects. But um, I think that I'm not the biggest fan of uh, any kind of showing anybody dying. I think that that's not a social change film, for sure. But the biggest thing about that is I, I think some of the different artistic merits that are um, part of telling a story, and are they telling a larger story that we can all be able to connect with? I think that that's the most important aspect. All right. I'm an aspiring videographer. I do this stuff as a hobby. It's gotten to be extreme with me. If I was to attend your festival, would there be things like technical talks, things that I could learn from? Because that's not only am I interested in social change, but just the art and the film itself. Could you ex ex convince me why I should attend? Yeah, so for the, we have a two-day thing that's also going to take place at Columbia, which is a couple of blocks away. Columbia College on 11th and State. A two-day intensive, like, um, the first day is pre-production and the second day is post-production. So the first day, um, different workshops and different rotations, and it's just kind of like a two-hour intensive uh, look into film and being able to see exactly how to use it, the different types of cameras, bringing in filmmakers and they can be able to show you the art, the craft, and the power of film. The second day, show you about editing. What are some of the new platforms? What are the different ways to tell the story? What are ways to use social media to be able to advance your cause? How do you use Kickstarter to raise money for your film? How do you use the National Endowment for the Arts to write a grant for a fund? Funding. Now, there's so many different types of ways. So, you know, once again, we know that there's some people that they don't want to watch a film, they want to learn something. So, we want to have something for them. They're part of the festival. Maybe they see just one film. They say, hey, I'll see one film and I'll go to this intensive for two days. We still think that that's hopefully inspiring you to one day shoot a video for a nonprofit at some point. I've already oh. done it, but uh, that's I, need the I need a lot more technical training. Thank you. Yeah, and really. We have a thing called Labor Bee here in Chicago that does all the filming. And if I saw you two hundred, your list of two hundred and fifty films that I could go to, how many would be relevant to the organized labor movement? I'd probably say that we received probably fifteen to seventeen, and maybe half of them are good. <laughs> Maybe third. Does this mean that the organized labor movement is irrelevant? Yeah, no, it's right. just it's what we receive, and you know, it doesn't have anything about it. It's not the Detroit. All right, Bob Matter. Yeah. Um, after this uh, theater shooting in uh, Colorado the other day. Uh, are they going to allow people to bring backpacks into the, the, the theater? Or do they have to go for metal detectors and all that? Like, you know, I'm going to get a ring on my crap. Uh, they turn away and they go, you can't bring that bag or something. Go put it in your car. And they go, I don't have a car. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is have a security type meeting to make sure everybody who bought a ticket understands what are the things that you can, can't do or have at the festival because it's a long day. Some people might want to pack a lunch. Some people might want to take their equipment. There's so many different things that are put in place. So that's something that we're going to spend weeks in trying to make sure. There's, no, uh, right now there's, no, uh, there's nothing. Yeah. There. Nothing so far. It's just yeah. the typical policies of that. Because we would hate to have an incident at a social change film festival. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. How many people have some remarks to make? Questions to raise? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About Maybe, eight eight minutes each. Maybe about ten right. minutes each. At least five minutes for at least a first round. Okay. All right. Okay. We line up chairs here, and of course, you get the closing remarks. Take careful notes of all the wisdom of your questions that we have raised. All right. Uh, okay. Without. Uh, Let's get our speakers going. So can we have more than five minutes? Why don't we make it ten, Brom? I think we could we could we could probably do it. Let's go with ten minutes. Most people don't have ten minutes worth of power. Six or seven to the most. Yeah, okay, maybe seven. All right, we'll up it to six. Okay. All right. Let's get this let's get this show on the road. There's an open mic. All right. I want to write down First, some of this stuff. First rebutter is Joe Mayer. Tell him to take a hike. Don't listen uh, to this. Hardly rebuttal, but uh, some comments on uh, not-for-profit organizations and uh, fundraising. When uh, I worked at the Legal Assistance Foundation, all of my clients were homeless people. There was great opportunities for filmmakers to document uh, the whole series of things that we did. All of my clients were homeless people. Some of them we did divorces for, some of them social security benefits, and so forth. The whole panoply of, uh, of, of legal benefits. Uh, in order to fund this, we did not rely, Bob, on uh, government funding. What we did rely on was an annual fundraising dinner in which uh, many of the lawyers and judges in the Chicago area were invited, and many of them came. We used to get uh, something like four or five hundred lawyers and judges coming to our annual banquet, and they, of course, contributed accordingly. Um, but one of the, that was nice. But one of the other things that lawyers are required to do is to provide pro bono service for uh, the general good and for the general good of the bar association. And what happened, uh, I, the unit that I was in, we, uh, we trained lawyers uh, to do work for homeless people and uh, how to handle homeless people for one thing. And the neat thing about it was they would spend one full day learning the legal aspects of how to do this. What, what were the issues that were involved in homelessness and how could they uh, ameliorate them. And then we would take them to a homeless shelter where we would have a clinic uh, once a week in different homeless shelters throughout the, uh, the Chicago area. Um, we, would, we would train the lawyers, we would get them to, to deal with the homeless people, we might even assign them a client of their own. And we never, never, never saw those people again. Not the homeless people, the lawyers. They just disappeared. They had met their obligation for their lifetime of <laughs> doing pro bono work, and they spent two whole days uh, out of each year doing that. Okay. Uh there were some, some uh, really interesting issues that came up in the questions. Um, and 
they made me um, think. Uh, Charles, Charles' comment or question, what, how would you define social change? I think it's a, it's a very valid one and a very hard to answer. Uh, I can't even imagine um, a social change defined by anybody that's not value-led and that has some values attached to them. Um, but I figure that most of the films that <coughs> Uh, included in social change here, have the betterment of society, of the whole society as a guideline. Uh, and there is another element, and that is how do we desensitize people to accept change? Because I think that's the, the hardest thing for people is to uh, get over the the talents or fear from change, whatever it is. Uh, we, we, we tend to kind of attach ourselves to what's familiar. So if there is a new music, we, we, most people say oh, that the new music is just noise. Uh, it's simply that the ear is used to a certain genre. So, um, it seems to me like the, the idea of social change as a focus is, is just excellent. It's something that's always, always needed. Um, so here, uh, a question by Bob as far as um, should the government fund uh, films in general or this one? Um, I feel, uh, I have an opinion. <laughs> I feel too. Uh, but my opinion is that the government should support both the arts and especially arts that has to do with social change. Why the arts? The arts are very, very instrumental to any society as far as encouraging potential creativity initiative. Those are great potentials that we need to leash rather than quiet them in terms of conventions and oppression. Um, you get more from society if you uh, encourage those uh, thinking for change, uh, for creativity. And social change is something that any government, free government that is, should encourage actually in a democracy. You want to change and progress, you don't want to stay in one place because then you fall behind. So, yes. Um, now, the question of um, violence, yeah, uh, used by, um, film by itself is just a powerful tool, okay? Uh, so to say because somebody there shot and was inspired by a certain film would be a mistake. Uh, the issues actually that have to do with the violence in this country have much more to do with, one, the gun control issues, two, mental health and poverty and social problems. So yes, if we have films that touch those issues, I would love to see an issue about the state of mental health in this country. It's scandalous. Um, so if we have those kind of um, films, uh, definitely, I think, it will help uh, people be more aware of the factors that are responsible for, for this scandalous situation in the country. So film by itself, Let's use it as a, as a tool. Um, now, as far as some, somebody asked about publicity, um, it is true that uh, the, film, the usual film fest in Chicago are poorly attended. Uh, the Chicago Underground Film Fest is doing pretty well, uh, maybe because it, it kind of deviates from the norm. Um, and I think that the idea that they have, you, they, um, 
about making it also a kind of a uh, training in filmmaking is an excellent attraction kind of hook for, for young people especially to, uh, to participate, not just to watch a movie that they can, uh, you know, maybe even have a DVD, but to be there and to be involved and to be involved also in discussion. Uh, I think that's, that's a great hook. Um, I hope that you are going to uh, have the uh, reader, Ed Kosiowski, uh, cover you. <laughs> yeah, I do know him, sure. And he, he usually um, covers uh, film um, and change. And, and they, are, they are the, uh, the yeast in the dough in, in, in Chicago. Um, and, um, you know, uh, try the Tribune. I don't know if you'll have luck, but... All I can say tonight is our speaker speaks to me with a uh, passion that I share to share. Because I myself, as most of you already know, am an amateur, a hobbyist gone extreme, close to becoming professional, but not quite geared that because I do have full-time commitments, and plus I do do a lot of volunteer work for a group called Toastmasters, which is a group that's dedicated to helping people speak in public. Well, I can tell you this, though. With the amount of video that comes in to like YouTube and to most any place, you can find a video on any subject you want on the internet. The big thing for me, though, is production quality. You know, most of the newer videos I've seen today, you know, a lot of our young people love the technical wizardry. They love the special effects. They love all the cool gadgets they can do, but they forget how to tell a story. They forget what the art of video is, is something to be watched and not something to be <coughs> mastered. They want, you know, and in my own settings, uh, I usually let most of my stuff run live or with minimal editing. Okay. Simply because, you know, people when they watch it on the web want to see the complete experience for the most part. With all the technical gaffes and all the problems involved, with, like we're having with the microphone now. Bottom line is, I think I may be attending this festival. I think I might be able to learn something well. And I really have to applaud our speaker tonight for giving a venue like this and uh, getting something going because I'll tell you, since I've gotten into the art of video making and, you know, recording people who are uh, good at something or, or good at doing things, preserving the memories of them are what, to me, is an important process. For example, here at the college, you know, I'm trying to get an archive from, like, the beginning of 2010 up to the present for the simple purpose of preserving the archive of speakers here, you know, and it's, it can be done for free, you know, YouTube's available, and I've got a super huge computer system at home that's got enough storage space to keep this stuff going for the next five years if I have to. But what you really have to remember about filmmaking is you're recording actual human beings, actual events, actual things that people do, and you know, it, like, like the arguments of television when it first came around in Germany in the 1930s uh, to some of the incredible stuff that D.W. Griffith did in the early teens with filmmaking upon the invention of such a novel idea as the close-up. We Americans first got involved with this stuff for in the, in the 19 teens and all the way through the 20s and the invention of the talking. It, it's just a fascinating field. So, if any of you have a passion for recording or even want to see some of these things, I strongly recommend you attend this festival. And I'd like to thank our speaker for coming here again to talk about it. Thank you very much. Yeah, government funding. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Abel, for, uh, for coming out tonight. I uh, thought it was uh, very, very interesting. And I, 
I'm going to try to get over there. So, is that a weekend? Is that going to be like Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Okay. I'm going to try to get over there uh, for something. I don't know what. Maybe uh, maybe spend one whole day there if I can. I've never been in that theater. Uh, yet. Have you been to Fastest? You ever been to Fastest? You don't. You know. You don't know Charles Coleman. You know. You know Charles Coleman. He's a University of Chicago guy too. Uh, I've been a volunteer at Facets for uh, 10 years, over 10 years. So I've seen a lot of films and uh, a lot of interviews with directors, small independent guys. I'm a real documentary film buff. Uh, I hardly ever miss a documentary. I'm not as big on uh, feature films, but occasionally, uh, you know, a feature film will touch me, like the current one that's there right now. But uh, yeah, uh, film really has a power to change people. It, no doubt about it. Uh, so you know, there's you know, there's just no question about that. And I can think of lots of films that have changed me and changed buying habits and all kinds of oh just all, all kinds what, of things. What film has changed you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of like Jeez, what what film has changed me? Well, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you one thing. It's a, a, a simple one. I saw a film about Dr. Bronner's magic soap a few years ago yeah, so at, at the Cisco Film Center. And you know, I tried some of that Dr. Bronner's soap. They gave, they gave away free samples at the theater, some sample little bottles. You know that he was a patient at my hospital. He was! Yeah. All in one! He used to say, all in one! All the time. Yeah. Well, anyway, I tried that little bottle of soap that they gave me, and you know what? Ever since then, I've been using Dr. Bronner's soap. I order it, you know, by the caseload from, it comes from California, and that's all I use now. I love that stuff. I love that stuff. It's all natural. Uh, you know, there's no, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to, to use it. I don't, what's that? Uh, it's, uh, you know, anyway, it's all organic, all natural, all that, no chemicals or anything. And, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a side thought, uh, or, or I'll say a, a, a benefit, um, they pay their employee. All their employees make like a minimum of thirty thousand a year, and they all have uh, insurance benefits. And no, I guess it's left over from the last one. And uh, no employee, uh, no executive makes more than ten times the lowest paid employee. So they're sort of. Uh, they're sort of what he called like, like uh, compassionate capitalism, you know. Oh. So it's just a generally, oh. so it's a generally, uh, you know, I think a generally a good, a good company to buy from. And I, I, I love that, uh, I love that Browner soap in it. You know, it smells good, and a little bit goes a long way. It's, it, you know, I just, I can just go on and on about, about that. But anyway, that's, and it was actually an interesting story in itself. Uh, you know, the story of Dr. Browner. Uh, just an interesting story. I mean, you know, there were Jews in Germany that had a soap factory, and uh, the Nazis, uh, you know, took the factory away from them and and uh, murdered them all, except for uh, you know one of them that came over here and started the, the started a soap business in a in a hotel on a second floor uh, in a second floor apartment building, making his own. The only thing you know to do is make soap, so he's making the soap and then selling it himself in uh, health food stores and things and then it in the 60s uh just you know kind of exploded with the hippie movement and uh, you can still get it in health stores and things like that but i i order it directly from dr browner's and uh, i said it's, it's he great. was a chemist he was yeah a he chemist. was a chemist yeah and 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 he was an eccentric and mm -hmm. that's why he was locked up in the hospital and by the way he escaped so anyway, that's one. But anyway, there's there's so many uh, great documentaries, and usually my I usually make a top ten list every year. I have a lot of my favorite document documentaries on there. This recent one about fracking was really good. I don't know if you saw that one. There was a documentary about flack, fracking. It was gas something. Uh, I forgot the name of it now. But that was really good. I've seen a couple of really good ones recently about about water, you know, about water problems. Um, one really good one about plastics, uh, all over in the and dangers of plastics and things. So there's a, just a lot of great things that really you know make you aware. Of course, I was curator of the Bike Winter Film Festival for five or six years. We had a lot of great biking films uh, that impressed me in all different kinds of ways, and 
And now myself and Bob Jean are curators at the Henry George School for our monthly film club. We have a film the second Saturday of every month, and then, and then we discuss it, and we, we discuss it from a from an economics uh, perspective uh, afterwards. And it's you know that's free, it's, you know something for us to to reach out on. Um, yeah. Now the thing about the funding of the arts, you know, I had to bring that up because you know that stuff I've been reading lately. I, I have to start thinking that if you, you know, if you if you don't like government spending on some projects, then you can't you can't have your own favorite ones that are, that are exact. You know, you you need to take it all off the table and just say, okay, this is what you know. We want government to, you know, uh, uh, enforce contracts and provide for the common defense, and that's about it. Anything else, we need to really really consider carefully if we want the government involved in. Uh, because if you know one person wants grant funding for the arts, another person says, "Well, we should have uh, funding for uh, bicycle programs. The government should buy everybody a bicycle." Someone else is saying, "Well, the government should give, should pay for massages for people because that's good too." So all that stuff is just like there's no to it. So it's probably just better to have nothing. And I don't like the idea of you know since the government uses coercive of force to take tax money away from taxpayers. You know that's the thing. Do we want to? You're holding a gun to somebody's head, taking money away from them forcefully. To go spend it on something like filmmaking or any other government program. Yes, and your time is up. Yeah, and that's what. Uh, so that's what we have to think. Uh, what that's what's really happening there. Thank you. Dave Zucker. Yes, sir. First of all, with regard to magic salt, I am regard. I have been put in mind of the remark that was mistakenly attributed to P.T. Barnum. That uh, fill in the blank, folks. There's a blank born every minute. <laughs> and it was profitable. Yeah, I'm sure it was, Tim. All right. You heard what I had to say earlier about the importance of the arts. And you heard what she had to say about how if we do not have arts, we discourage creativity, and we do not stand, and we wind up standing in the same place. No. Now, in the 1950s, from when I was an infant, from what I gathered, there was no government funding for the arts. The moment that you suggested funding for the arts in those days, uh, somebody who, like a certain previous speaker, believed in the days when William McKinley was president, <laughs> uh, only at that time Dwight Eisenhower was, uh, would stand up and holler, socialism, socialism! And arts funding got taken off the table. Well, then John Kennedy became president of the United States, thank God. And while he didn't know that much about the arts except for literature, after she was an expert, he nevertheless encouraged his wife to, have, to uh, show off her interest in the arts, and he put his presidential imprimatur onto that. Suddenly there was government funding for the arts, lots of it. And it's important that we keep that for the reasons that were already given. And I'm not a big believer in axing government funding for the arts and in treating it as just another government program to be taken off the table. This no matter what they have to say about it in Indiana. <laughs> as I said, I'm not a believer in, in taking arts off the table. Thank you. I got in so-called science, because science, some of it, is pseudo-science and used like some of the artists use for propaganda purpose. Like for instance, they tell you they go in the mob. Ain't no fucking way they can get the mob. But they can sell you this because they sold you heaven. 
They sold you the man behind the cloud, and they sold you the model. Because if you listen, guess what they say? All you have to do is give us four more years. Oh, in 40 years from now, we can be doing this and doing that. Well, the odd is a little more uh, real than that. Because see, the artists, the poor, the homo, the SR, the Virgil, or the Dante, they created this. These are creations that come from an individual. And I have to admire that. I admire creativity. It ain't no motive here other than poetry. The other stuff that they taught me is for the status quo. And that's one of the comments that I have to make tonight. Now it's nice for the speaker, and I'm 76 years old. I seen it, I did it, I have been there. And if I had to wait another 76 years, I wouldn't see the most shit that I ain't seen yet that they promise, including ever, and going to the moon, or going to Mars. Or uh, we can make a heart that operate just like the one you got in your body. Or we can uh, 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 start a chain reaction with cold fusion. They would come up with all, they come up with all kinds of bullshit that I seen that was verified to be a goddamn lie and a hoax and never happened. However, how can you uh, not be behind somebody like the speaker? Now, he believed he's inspired. He believed that he can make a change. Well, why am I accepting him? Because the whole people that came before him, in the name of even a Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, uh, 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 Christ, Kant, uh, 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 Spinoza, uh, uh, Aristotle, Nicomitian ethics. I mean, these was people that put forward a whole bunch of stuff that I believe it was sincere when they put it forward. But there ain't nothing wrong with that. So I can't, I'm not criticizing the speaker, but I've been here, I seen it, and I did it. Listen, ain't no changes gonna be made with the masses because people in charge benefit from the stupidity, the fear, the ignorance of the masses. I don't care how idealistic I am, Aristotle, Cat, or the speaker, we cannot overcome that status quo that benefits from ignorance, from chaos, from dying and death, disease, and everything else out there. How are you so negative? Somebody would say, I'm negative because I seen it, I've been there, and I've been waiting for seven. Oh, by the way, I had a daddy. And he had a daddy. And ain't none of them told me, boy, when I was this, it was like this, and some real that that changed because of some man ingenuity, some man godlike ability. All of that is bullshit. But they give you Santa Claus for inspiration. They give you the man behind the cloud for inspiration. They even had a horse that won a race in the city. He became an inspiration. And they got all kinds of books and pictures that gives you inspiration. But I cannot get away from reality. And the reality that I see is a kind of reality that I got to believe in. And if I'm going to be wrong, it's going to be wrong because if I'm going to be wrong, let me be wrong for my thinking and not somebody else's. All right. First of all, let's thank her again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good luck with your program. I, I've done that kind of stuff, and it gave me an enormous amount of work. I hope it's a success. If anything, you by bringing together these people achieved of some measure there. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Uh, let's begin. Uh, the technology film that Tim was a little bit alluding to, it's amazing how it's changed over the years. I was talking with March here. Um, Actually, I produced a film. I've been in been my hobby and pursuit since uh, a teenager, and I even worked an eight millimeter film. I, that really dates me, I think. But I used to do photography stuff between semesters to relax, and it was practice 
trying to do an anti-war one. Uh, but yeah, today it's, it's a very forgiving thing. The technology aspect of film, though, especially this, this medium, it, is almost non-existent. It, anybody can, it's a point and shoot kind of situation here, whereas years ago, it required some, some real knowledge and expertise of lighting and things of that nature. I was amazed, I bought a single lens reflex camera and it cam comes equipped with the video equipment internalized in the camera with the sound recording features and things like that. A very good quality actually and I, I have no idea how to operate it or ever intend to use it. Nevertheless, it's a feature that's incorporated in the cameras these days. It's just an added feature. Um, but anyhow, it's changed, and it seems like any lefty who's got an issue can pick up a camera and do something with it. Sometimes their quality works, something, sometimes they're insufferable. I should add, at the college here, I kind of declined um, from speakers from showing movies too long for two reasons. Number one, um, it's kind of a crutch from speaking. I think we liked an exchange format. And these documentaries are available online very often. And unless there's some inherent graphic feature and things like that, and I, inherently I don't think the College of Complex is, is, is a film type media thing. I don't want us turning into that kind of situation here. I think that wouldn't be a transition. Though something, a, a short video perhaps, uh, to facilitate a, a speech is probably okay. I, I try to keep it down and so that we're just not sitting here. The one reason I say that is because I get it every month an update. These things you can subscribe to and it's got documentaries of the month. Very often they're online, you can load it, they're inexpensive and they have a whole library of things and it comes out every month if anybody wants that information. I can, I can get that to you. I get it every month and I take a look at what's going on because th sometimes we have speakers that don't show so we keep videos in reserve. All right, now another, my other connection with film, actually in library school, becoming a librarian, we have to do major projects. They're like someone for the humanities. I actually designed a film library, a reference library, a minimum of 500 the very best reference books and reference materials and on the subject of film. It took me six months to do it. It was quite an arduous project, but I designed a film library and spent went to many places like Lincoln Center and things like that to see what their collections were and things like that. Okay, we've been over that, the college documentary of the month. Oh, the other thing I was asking about labor issues as being a topic of your social change. Uh, Bob knows him. Joe Barry, I've studied under him at the University of Illinois. He loves to show labor, labor type films. And I've sat through them many, many times. That's part of the coursework is there's a certain genre there and a select dozen or so films that are the core that we have. Also, my own union produced the video. I'm glad the deadline is still here. The one guy got it in his notion that he was going to produce a video on how vitally important federal employees were to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually did a video, and I'd like to get it to you. So then I think the people of the United States should know how important it is that people like me are doing what we do every day. Make sure they see it in Indiana. <laughs> it's actually terrible. This is, this is awful. But I, um, let's see, I got something other here I disavow Hollywood. Yeah, I haven't seen a movie. I can't remember when. I, I think I saw Gettysburg. That was it. That was a long time ago. I really don't care too much for Hollywood. I'm not averse to it, but I'm, I'm not a film guard and things like that. Nevertheless, it looks like a fun thing. This is an important thing. Anything that gets the message across, uh, you know, and, and heightens some of the awareness on some very important issues. I guess if it's a speaking presentation like this, or a flyer, or a little tabloid, or a 60 minutes type thing, or some stuff on the internet, and if it takes a video, 
there certainly are some issues that are not looked at and we, we simply don't want to turn the blind eye to these. But thank you very much. Second round or just close it down? I saw Kay Myers in the uh, living accommodation she's got, and uh, she uh, says if somebody would bring her here, she would come. But they would have to be aware that uh, she's 97 odd years old and uh, I might have to leave a little early. and. Uh, they, uh, and you do have to pay attention to her. Uh, so if you are so inspired, just speak to me about it, okay? Is she Lucy? Oh, yes. Okay, I just want to remind everybody that on uh, October 12th, Atlas Shrub Part 2 is open <laughs> in theaters. So. Yes. I can't, I can't wait. wait. Yeah, right. Where's where my picket sign? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do another round. So just uh, we have time, and it's uh, I want to echo something that uh, you said, Jean, about reality and the prospect of social change. And uh, you know, I have very mixed up feelings about that because. Sometimes I feel like you, that, you know, humanity is just going in circles. And um, I'm not sure even, I mean, films, I think films can raise awareness quite a bit. And by raising that and being powerful also emotionally, I mean, that component is very important. I mean, they have to be... To, 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 the art form has to move you to go to the pleasure center and that maybe give you, gives you the motivation to also get off your ass and maybe do something. Um, how successful it is, um, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's, a it's a logical mistake to say that this is reality. We are talking about social change, so there is no static reality. We should, I mean, the purpose is to have a reality that's dynamic. It would be the reality of the time. Um, so we, we, we can't just throw our arms, even though sometimes it feels like, uh, you know, we're banging the head in the wall. Uh, I mean, I feel guilty myself when I see every time I, I told Martin, I see on Facebook that the photo of a kid in Africa that's all like bones and, and skin and kind of sitting crouched on the, on the dirt waiting to die, I suppose. And uh, we are debating which restaurant we are going to go eat at night. Um, it will never be enough. It will never, we will never care for other the way we care for our own self and, and, and the little circle around us that is a reciprocal kind of, uh, uh, you know, do good. So, you know, those, those, are, those are real issues. And, and, and I don't know that we will ever get to that point but still, you see some changes. Um, I see it more in, Eastern, in Western Europe. Um, I see that, that Houston, the younger generation, is, is more conscious to issues of justice and human rights um, than it is here. So there are social differences. Uh, there are also very, very encouraging of the arts, okay? Kids there, um, 
at night, uh, they, they are not that much into the uh, the bears or the big sports, although they are also into sports, but they are um, very much into culture and arts. Now, are they connected? Is it associated? I don't know, but I have a hunch that the more people are involved in issues, the more likely they are to eventually be involved in change, in positive change. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Dans le patois d'Haïti, Emir est un grand <laughs> I do believe that government should provide some funding for the arts, at least on an educational basis and on an ongoing basis. Why? Because I believe that art and art components and classes are essential to economic growth and development in this country. And if you don't believe me, you can go back to a story that was well known in 1995 by the founder of uh, Apple, Steve Jobs. And he talks a lot about the development of the Macintosh computer and a lot of the reasons why it was such a widely used platform for graphic artists and designers was a lot of the reason was because 10 years earlier he had taken some classes in calligraphy at a junior college when he was exploring where to go and what to do. And because of that knowledge, he was not a good calligrapher, but because of the knowledge that he had of calligraphy, he was able to incorporate type fonts into the operating system for the Macintosh. There is story after story after story of artistic work being done and being brought down to a practical economic innovation that has literally changed this country over time. I'll give you another one that readily comes to mind, and that's just Thomas Edison himself and the industrial laboratory he had, and the creativity, and the toil, and the work, and the things that he had to do to just get the light bulb going. You still don't believe me? Take a look at the work of Dr. Richard Florida, economist from, uh, you know, the right now up in Toronto, who says that some of the most innovative communities in the world where they spark the most entrepreneurship have an active arts component structure. Why? Because people today, when they work, they work a lot, they work very hard, and when they want to play, they want to go to the theater, they want to see uh, things like this. And with art and art and painting and all this other type of innovative stuff, it tends to breed a culture of creativity, of thinking outside the box. Remember, these are human beings and if you're wanting to innovate new products, new developments, and keep the engines of capitalism running, art is a, com as a, as a real distinct component of that. And I'm sure our speaker would agree with me because of all the stuff that's been well, going on with this film and, <laughs> and all, the, all this uh, other stuff. You think it's nonsense, Charlie? I don't. There's some of the most creative stuff you've seen have come from the marketing departments of large corporations in the form of propaganda, which if you define art, can be considered good art. Look at the art of the Soviet Union, for example, and some of the great propaganda that it did. That, in and of itself, is, is, can be construed of art. Or have you seen some of the stuff that was done in the early 30s by the Hitler regime, that some of these films that are still banned in Eastern Europe? Again, they're good art. But can it be done in a, in a good format? Yes. Because at that same time, like that story I related with Steve Jobs and some of the other things, works. Now, if you look at the, in, a lot of these software applications and creativity tools, once you get them in the hands of an artist, incredible things can be done. And I'm sure just with the applications and the apps and the smartphone and everything else, it's very clearly an arts component is given this in the art is a of techie, innovation. Techie money maker. He's not socialist. an artist. He's not, not an artist. artist. We'll get six don't get six minutes twice. You get six oh, minutes. We're done. Some techie money making bastard. <laughs> it's an I, artist. I, I, I want to say that <laughs> most of them responded to Ayala. Listen, I got 
dis uh, honorable discharge from the army. That means that I did my duty successfully. I retired from a job after 39 years. That means they paid me and I got a pocket full of money. That means I was successful. I have, I'm not so uh, uh, unique, I'm not so uh, a bunch of isolation that, I, that I've stepped out physically. No, I can harmonize with my neighbor. I've been living in a complex for 38 years. Ain't no neighbor can say nothing about me, but says a nice man that mind his business and go about his business. I'm capable of playing the role that is necessary for me to meet my interests. But spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and philosophically, I do my own goddamn thing. And I don't know how many times I have to repeat this. And this is all I'm saying. Two, two things. It only going to take 30 seconds. Another man ain't shit to me when he calls himself above me. Because if he was above me, she or him, the ass would be going to Rose Hill Cemetery. <laughs> if you're going to Rose Hill Cemetery, you're going to the same fucking place I'm going, so that don't mean, that mean you ain't got shit on me and ain't got shit on nobody else. So why should I listen to you? That's all I be saying when I'm, when I'm at this uh, uh, podium here. That's all I'm saying, that I don't buy some other person as my hero. I'm saying, he knows all I got to do is wait, and he's going to make a hard, I can live 400 years. All I got to do is wait. I don't believe that shit. He gives you that kind of shit so you don't respect yourself and ain't got no confidence, and he can lead your monkey ass around any way he want to. But do I know how to act in a church? I don't use the bad words where I go up in them churches or home, uh, in a fume. I don't, the only reason I go up in there. When I go to somebody's house, do you think I use that profanity? Do you think I don't have social graces and know how to act? I know more about that than anybody in here. But I'm talking about different things. Like Tim is talking about progress, tell me about some goddamn gadget, TV, and, 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 and computers, and all of that shit. I ain't never had none of that, never will. That ain't the argument I'm having about. That ain't creativity to me. Some asshole come up with something and say, oh, give me $5,000. Uh, oh, I'm going to start an IPO and my corporation go public and I'm going to sell $10 billion worth of, of money. All of that's supposed to be creativity. That's exploiting, exploitation of the goddamn masses, and that's my argument. I, uh, Jesus Christ. I like the <laughs> Jesus didn't Martin need any of those reasons. Which indicated that you were looking in your in the work that was submitted for actionable steps uh, to be taken to implement change. You know, I may be a little hip to on Jesus, but he did exactly this. He, people came to him with their ailments. The people came to him with their problems and their perplexities, and he dealt with them, the, the drunks and the uh, people with problems in their families and the... Those were the apostles, and the, right? You know, and he trained his disciples, uh, many of whom were also the people who came to him with their problems, to do likewise. And he sent them out, he organized them in, in groups, uh, 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 usually at least two together, uh, to go out to uh, visit uh, different towns and villages and 
uh, little communities in Galilee uh, to present the possibility of change of the kingdom of God. And letting God rule you it gave hope to a whole lot of people. And if uh, you expect to act on what you learn, you might do something. And if you see other people acting uh, to realize their hopes and uh, overcome their fears, then you too can be encouraged. And uh, I'm glad to see you that much in uh, this uh, project. Yeah, and any films on Jesus? <laughs> the passion of Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah. No films on Jesus? Hanging on the cross. Well, why don't you make a few chats? Uh, it's quite ugly, and I'm afraid that it's often artistically recording, but it does uh, show where somebody's heart is. Yeah, right here. First time. I would like to say that I didn't fairly, but I'd like to thank our speaker for coming out tonight. And uh, I hope your, your festival is a success. I plan to come and see at least some of it. You are. Second, with all due respect to Jim, who's an intelligent, very intelligent guy, I don't think the world is so hopeless as he makes it out to be. Uh, it's not always easy to live with. And last but not least, Yes, I believe that someday we will go to Mars. Curiosity just made it. Thank you. Huh. Hey, speaker no gets the last word. We may have to. Let's get it done. It's great to hear the energy and uh, passion in yeah. uh, each one of you guys. Uh, this has really been a humbling experience, and I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, in, in addition to that, you know, one of the things that kind of guides my principles of what I do, why I do what I do, why I could have been making more money doing other things, but I choose to do what I do, is because I do think that maybe we need to innovate the way we think about things. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to throw a hundred million dollars, a billion dollars at a problem and hope that it goes away, right? And that's what we're arguing about, you know, or not we're arguing about, but in a lot of different capacities within our government, right? Should we throw money at this problem, or should we let people solve them themselves? Or should we find a combination of two? What is that sweet spot that we need to be looking at? And I think the interesting thing about what we're trying to do at our festival is trying to stay as idealistic as possible. And I think that what our goals are, you know, moving forward in terms of thinking, hey, if we move the bar forward just a little bit, is that something we can report on? Is that something we can be excited about and think that maybe we did it, made a difference? You know, maybe we can't say we ended homelessness tomorrow, because we're not going to be able to say that. But if we can report back and say, hey, there's a tangible way of thinking how we help moving this bar along, that is something that excites me, and that's something that is kind of our mission statement, why we're doing what we're doing on a volunteer basis. So thank you again for everything. Thanks for the remarks. Learned a great deal, and um, I'm excited about some of the other programs you have. Come again. Only closes tonight's College of Conferences. No films of us.